It's the altar time. It's your altar time. It's your altar time. Whatever it is that you need to leave at the altar, whatever's pressing on your heart, there's an altar. Father, the sins of our nation, our country, Father, we lay them at the altar. The corruption, Father, the, the love of money, God, the love of power, Father, the lust of the eye, Father, we lay it at the altar right now. The disdain for human life, Father, we lay it at the altar right now. Greed that's in our hearts that captivates and controls our thoughts and our DNA of who we are, Father, we lay it at the altar right now. The sins in, of our parents and our grandparents, the generational curses, Father, we lay them at the altar right now. God, the spirit of offense, Father, we lay it at the altar right now. The forgiveness, God, the, the, the begrudging that we hold on to, Father, we lay it at the altar right now. The impure thoughts, God, the impure deeds, the impure lifestyle, Father, we lay it at the altar right now. The lust of the heart, Father, we lay it at the altar. The sickness, Father, the mental illness, Father, the, the, the struggles, the oppression, we, we lay it at the altar. Thoughts of insecurities, God. Thoughts that are not like yours, we lay them at the altar. Our addictions and afflictions, Father, we lay them at the altar right now. At the altar. So we cast off all the cares of this world this morning. Cast off all cares. Grocery list, what I have to do this week, we cast it off right now. What I forgot to do last week, Father, we cast it off right now. What mistakes I made yesterday, last week, Father, we cast them off right now. All things, we cast them off right now, Father, because you care for us. God, as we cast, you care. I cast, you care. I cast off, you care. So, Father, fill us with your caring love and your spirit. Because you see us. You know us. You created us. You love us. You've given us life in our lungs. To breathe, Father. To breathe, God. To breathe, Father. To breathe, God. With every inhale and exhale, we breathe in new life. Because you said that we shall live and not die. So I live. I won't die. I choose to live. I won't die. I choose to live. And I won't die. So life today, Father. I choose life today, Father. For everything in my life that wanted to die last week, we breathe CPR into it right now. We bring back vision, Father. We breathe CPR into it right now. Visions and goals and dreams, God, we ask you to wake it up right now and breathe life in it right now. Things, Father, that we've abandoned, Father, purposes that we've abandoned, Father, your kingdom that we're supposed to be building, but we've abandoned, Father, we breathe life into it right now. In our marriages, we breathe life into it right now. Even in the divorce, God, we breathe life into the relationship right now. Even in the custody battle, we breathe life into it right now. Even in the politics of this nation, we breathe life. We bring life. We bring life. We bring life. We breathe life. We bring life. We breathe life. Life. We breathe life. Somebody say, I will live. I will not die. Somebody else say, I will live. And I will not die. 
Point to somebody, say, you will live. You will not die. Somebody raise your hand and say, we will live. And we will not die. We will live. We will not die. I will live. I will not die. I will live. I will not die. I will live. I will not die. I will live. Not die. Say, I will live. I will live. And not die. And not die. I will live. And not die. I will live. I will live. And not die. I will live. I will live. And not die. And not die. Word says, I will live. And not die. And not die. I will live. I will live. And not die. And not die. I don't know who's contemplating suicide where you are. But I'm declaring over your life that you will live. Your marriage will live. Your children will live. Your dreams will live. Father, this fight that we're fighting right now, you've already given us victory. And for that, I shall live. I shall live. I shall live. I shall live. The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But I declare that today that I will live. That I will live. I will live. The reality of it right now is the enemy's forming weapons right now against your plan, against you, against your ministry, against your ideas, against your vision, against what you're trying to build. He's forming, but the Bible says weapons may be formed, but they won't prosper. They will be formed, but they won't prosper. They will be formed. They will be sharpened. They will be loaded. They will be aimed, but they won't prosper. Bullets are coming by your head now. Arrows, fiery arrows are coming by your head right now. But there is a protector. There is a hands of protection around you and you will live you will live you will live said that he would be a hedge, a hedge of protection around you. Some of us need to be a hedge of protection from ourselves because some of us are, are detrimental to ourselves. But just know that God is saying that even though, even though you may be a detriment to yourself, the Holy Spirit has plans to prosper you. It has plans for you to, to make it, for you to live, for you to grow, for you to build, for you to conquer, for you to grow out of this. If you just keep on fighting, you just keep on fighting, you just keep on fighting, you keep waking up, you keep on fighting, you will live, you will live, you will live. For the word says, for the word says, for the word says. 
To success, somebody say the secret. Tap your tap your kids, tap your your, your person that you're here with. If you're not sitting next to nobody, just look across the room. Say the secret to success. It's the secret. It's the secret. It's the secret. Can't tell nobody. This is only for the for the Christian community. It's only for those that believe in God. He says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, he's saying, if my spirit abides in you and you stay connected to me, he says, then you will bear much fruit. When you're bearing fruit, that means that you're living. That means that you're producing things. That means that new things are being birthed. That means that new ideas are being birthed. New love is coming forth. That means old things are passing away, but God is giving new life. But he says that you have to abide in me, and I will abide in you. That means that the gossip, that means that the lust. He says all of those things are products of the flesh, but as long as you abide in me, I abide in you. I abide in me. I abide in you. Abide in me, abide in me, abide in you, abide in me, abide in you, say much fruit, say many fruit, say much fruit, say many fruit, say much fruit, say lots of fruit, that's too much fruit, that's too much fruit, say grow up, say grow up. Say grow up, say grow up, say this tree in me, this tree in me, this tree in me, this tree in me is growing up. Say we growing up, say it's going up, it's going up, not going down, it's going up, cause I'm growing up, cause I'm growing up. Cause I will, live I will live and not die. I will live, I will live and not die. And not die. I will live and not die. I will live and not die. Father, I thank you. Thank you. We're living this morning, God. I'm looking around. I'm looking at life this morning. Even if we're tired in praise and worship, hey, it's okay to be tired. Cause that means you're just pushing through. You're just pushing through. You're just pushing through. You're just taking a break. But you're growing up. I'm going up. I'm growing up. I'm going up. We growing up. I'm going up. We growing up. I'm going up. In every pruning season, every pruning season, say pruning season. I got an orange tree that's in front of my home, and when the freeze came, how many of your vegetation, it died, 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 it died. And uh, I was going to cut mine down, but my neighbor said, give it a chance. Give it a chance. Give it a chance. Somebody say, give it a chance. Just give it a chance. Just give it a, give it a chance. Say, let it, prune it back, prune it back, and give it a chance in order for it to grow. See, when I started out this year, I said growth wouldn't be easy. And some people are experiencing that growth is violent, that, that things have to be cut, things have to, that, to, to happen. Freeze is coming, things have to be cut. Freeze is coming, things have to be cut. Freeze is come and have to be cut off. But don't chop down your life. Give it a chance to grow. Certain things, you may have to dig around it. You may have to dig around it. You may have to uh, put some, some special nutrition to it. You may have to give some more time to it, but give it a chance. You're in a season. You're in a new position. You're in a new atmosphere. Just give it a chance because if God has planted you there, he's going to grow you there. Amen. Somebody say, just like the seed has to fight through the death, just like it has to fight through the earth, just like it has to fight through the, the, uh, the elements and the rain and also the winters of life that come, just fight through and give it a chance. Amen. Somebody say, fight through. Say, fight through.
Father, I thank you, Lord. How many people know that opposition will happen? Just raise your hand. Say, opposition will happen. Now, now with your hand that's, that's held high, I want you to make this declaration. That no matter what opposition, say, no matter what, no matter what. Opposition, opposition, God has given me another chance. No matter who stands before me, God has given me the tools to fight through. I will use all weapons of mass destruction given to me to kill the things that's against me. I will love. I will choose joy. I will practice patience. I will have insight. I will use wisdom. I will be obedient. I will be faithful because I know that these tools are weapons of mass destruction. I will not exchange hate for hate. Offense for offense. Slug for slug. Punch for punch. But I will choose love. I will choose love. I will choose love. In the hardest elements, fights of my life, I choose love. I choose love. I choose love. I choose love. Because I know it's the greatest weapon in my life. Somebody give God a hand clap of praise for that declaration. Thank you so much, praise team. And I will choose love. I will choose love for every battle. I want to sing again, but I'm going to stop. See, that's, that, that's life for me to know that a person that tried to kill themselves, that, that's, a, that's, that's my testimony, that I tried to take my life out. But he said that I would live and not die. And now here I am, some 28 years later, and I'm standing, and I've accomplished some things, and God is accomplishing other things through me, and he's allowed me to be a blessing to other people. This past week, I had somebody reach out to me from my past, and they said, I heard you tell your testimony, and I was on the verge of killing myself, but I remember what you said. And so I'm living because of the the miracle that God did in my house, in my bedroom, when he didn't allow me to die. He's now giving life to other things that are around me. That's that's when he says that you shall live. Your testimony shall live. Your life shall live. Your, you shall live and not die. And I know many other people may have that same testimony that they've tried to abandon. They've tried to quit. They've tried to give up. But God told them to continue to fight through. And so this morning, I'm, I feel victorious. Anybody else feel victorious? I, just, I feel victorious that, that the week that the week didn't get away from me. I know we, we've had more, more shootings. We, we've seen more violence, whether it be from football players or whether it be from police officers. We, we see things and, and we experience these things and, and things are happening. But in the midst of that, we know that God is going to get the glory even in the end. Because the Bible says that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So I know that what they say on the news is not the whole story. I know it's just fragments of the story. It's fragments of what has happened over the billions of people that walk on this earth. It's isolated in, in, uh, 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 incidents that happen, and we won't cast out the good of man because of isolated incidents. We will be able to know that love, perfect love, can drive out fear. That we can continue to move on and fight through and do what God has called us to do in this season. Amen? And so my, my, my hope is that you continue to fight. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the word of God. I thank you for your encouragement and your strength to move on and to endure things and to hope in all things and to trust in things and to know, Father, that you are here, that you're our support, that you're our great supplier, that 
You're our energy when all energy has run out. You're our love when all love has run out. You are insight, Father, when knowledge is lacking, Father. You are our gas, Father, when we're on E, Father. You are our fill-up. You are our maintainer, Father. You are our sustainer, Father. You're our way maker, Father. You are our friend in a time of need, Father. You are a lawyer in the courtroom, God. You go before us and you make ways. You open doors for us, God. People that we thought that were against us, God, we see that they have been working for us, God. We see that things that have fallen down in front of us be the foundation to build up on those things, Father. We see that doors that were closed in our lives were just uh, elements and arrows to keep us moving in the right direction, Father. We see, Father, that hallways and places, Father, that looked like dead ends were just roundabouts for us to go in the right way, Father. We see, Father, that when we got laid off that you made a way for another way to be open, Father. We saw, God, that even in the relationship when it didn't work, Father, you opened it up for us to find the love of our lives, Father. We even saw, God, that when you took our children away from us, even in a season, Father, loss of a custody battle, Father, that you didn't lose uh, the relationship, God, that, that parenting was still able to go forth, God. We know that in some seasons, Father, it seemed like things may be dead, Father, but just like Lazarus, Father, you can call it forth. You can say, get up. You can take off those grave clothes because it's time for you to live. And so, Father, I thank you right now, God, that there are things that are living around us right now that they should live and not die. And so, Father, as we crack open your letter unto us, we ask that you give us understanding, wisdom, wisdom, and insight so that we can see what you have called us to do, that we can fix and finish the race that is set before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're walking through the book of Ezra, and we know that last week we said we had to fight to collaborate and uh, I know that whenever I preach something, there's always an experience that, that happens to show you opposition, show you things that you have to, to fight through, show you things where you have to, to, to make yourself connect with other people and make yourself love people when you don't want to. And you have to love after offense and you have to go through things and, 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 and to fight through. And I know that God is working miracles even in the midst of those situations. We see a, a different thing happening in the book of Ezra. And this book of Ezra is so short, not a book that we, you know, well-versed in, not one that we are go-to. It's not the, the go-to for many of us, but it's so much wisdom inside. And this week, they're trying to build the temple. Say, build the temple. And they've come together. They have fought through the collaboration. We know that the old and the young were having issues with working together because one uh, was upset that it didn't look the way that the old school looked, and these other folks were excited because they were able to build something and saw it coming into fruition. But we know that whenever you're a triple threat, there's always going to be some type of adversity. Say adversity. Say opposition. Opposition comes to stop you from uh, moving forward. It comes to stop you from getting things done. It, keeps, uh, it wants to stop you from living your best life. It knows that you have something good inside of you and the enemy's coming to steal, kill, and destroy that thing. And in chapter 4, we see the enemy standing up. But we know that when the enemy stands up, that doesn't mean that we have to stand down. When the enemy stands up, we do not have to stand down, but we can stand knowing that God is going to fight through our battles. And in this book of chapter 4 in Ezra, I don't know if this is how we should handle situations. And I'm going to give you some scenarios that we can kind of play with and walk through and Maybe look at our own lives and see how God is working things out together for his good. But in this moment, we see some things happening, and I want to read the word of God for you. It says, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the returned exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the family heads and said to them, let us build with you. Now, these are Samaritans. These are folks that have been intermingled with, with Jews. These are people that are not pure blood. They're not uh, of the true uh, house of Israel. And this is so subtle when it, it comes in the form of help. That these people come to them and they say, hey, we, we see you guys are building a temple. We want to help. That's good, right? People are coming to help to build the temple. And they say, let us build with you. For we also worship your God. And have been sacrificing to him since the time King Esau Hadon of Assyria brought us here. It says, but Zerubbabel, Jeshua, 
and the other heads of Israel's families answered them, you may have no part with us in building a house for our God, since we alone will build it for the Lord. The God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. It says, then the people were already in the land discouraged. They tried to discourage the people of Judah and made them afraid to build. How many of you know that when God gives you an assignment, God gives you a decree, God gives you uh, a vision, he gives you understanding, he gives you a plan, that there are going to be subtle enemies that come in very tactile formats. See, these Samaritan people were coming to help the Jews built this temple so that they could infiltrate the army so that they could discredit the work, so that they could stop the work, so that they could sabotage the work from the inside. But it was up to the leaders in this area to be able to say, no, we already know what you're coming for. We already see what you're trying to do. We already know what's about to happen with this work and you can't work with us. Now, what do we learn from that? We learn that in every situation that God gives us, there's always going to be in counterfeit. Say counterfeit. So it's always going to be something that looks good, but it's not really good. The counterfeit always comes before the good. Real life situation. So this week I had to get my, my second shot, my second vaccine. And I went and I got my shot. And as I started to thinking about the shot, when the lady shot me, I said, you're just gonna, you got a mask on, but you're about to give me COVID in my arm. And she started to laugh. I said, you have a mask on, but you're about to give me COVID. Why do you have a mask on? If you're gonna give me COVID, I'm gonna get sick anyway. You might as well take your mask off. And we begin to laugh, but then God started to resonate that in my mind and in my spirit. And as I was talking the scripture over with Pastor Chris this morning, he says, the enemy tries to vaccine your dreams. That he will try to inject you with something so that your real dreams won't come true. He'll try to give you a false dream in your arm so that your real dreams you'll never see. See, a vaccination, all it gives you the thing before the thing so that your body can fight it off so that the disease never kills you. And so what the enemy tries to do is he tries to put uh, false goals in your arm so that your real goals never come true. But if you understand the plots of the enemy, you'll say, I don't want to vaccinate my dreams. I don't want to vaccine my dreams. I want to see what God is doing. Somebody said wants to see. Say, I want to see what God is doing. No vaccination for me, please. Because I don't want my dreams vaccinated because if I allow too many people in on this deal, if I allow too many people in on this dream, it could cause conflict and it could cause my dream to be deferred. And so God gives the leaders of this movement that are trying to rebuild the temple, it gives them wisdom. And how many of you know that if you turn down the enemy who's trying to be your friend, he will show himself if you allow him to show himself. I need some people to say, enemy, show me yourself. Show me yourself today, Father. I need you to give me spiritual insight so that you can show me what's around me. Show me who's in the camp. Show me who's trying to be attached to me that's not for me. Show me who's trying to infiltrate that's against me, God. Show me the enemies that are around me, God, that may look like they're for me, God, but are really against me. And so in the midst of this, God gives them spiritual insight to know that these people are not for them, but they are against them. And this is what we see in verse 4 and 5. It says, then the people who were already in the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build. But I just thought that you guys were for me. I thought you guys wanted to see me flourish. I thought you guys wanted to see the dream come true. It says, then after they were denied, they then began to hate. See, when people can't come to you where God is blessing you, when they can't be a part of you, then if they can't be a part of you, then they're automatically against you. Not that they will go off and build their own thing and build their own temple to God. No, they want to stop you building your life. They want you to, to stop building your success. They want to tear down your marriage. They want to tear down your relationship because you didn't let them on the inside. That's how you can tell who's for you and who's against you. If you deny somebody access as you're building and they stay committed and they stay faithful and they pray for you and they still love you, they still are gracious to you. That's how you know that people are really for you. 
I have a neighbor, and my neighbor I used to go to the church, and one day he decided that it, it wasn't the place for him, and he left the church, and he said, I, I was scared to leave because I thought that, that you were going to look at me differently, that you were not going to talk to me anymore, that, that we weren't going to be friends anymore. And he says, but over these years, you've always been there. You continue to talk to me. You don't talk down on me. You're not bad to me. You didn't isolate me. You weren't against me. I say, because I'm for you. Because when you understand what you've been built for, your ministry, your, your, your thing that God has given you, you don't have to treat other people bad because they leave or because you, you deny them or because they say no. No, you just love them and keep moving. It may not be for you in this season, but you continue to show love because love will cast out fear. And so in the midst of this, it says now... The same people that they said, hey, let's build, Wesleyan. Let's get this business together. And Wesleyan is like, no, it's not the best time for, for me to be able to take on new clients. These people are now giving Wesleyan bad reviews. They now go out and slander her name in the community. And they say, this woman, she's terrible. Tear down the business. They're trying to, to fight because now they feel like they've been hurt. But anybody know that when we're graduating in this belt, remember we talked about these belts that we're, we're having as we grow in these belts, as we go from a white belt to a brown belt, there are going to be ways that we have to change the way that we respond when denial is up on us. So after they start to intimidate, Westling, you better let me help you or I'm going to tear you down. You better play for me or I'm going to open up all of these court cases against you and, and talk about how you was in these massage parlors and how all of these things have happened and all of these people that you've been with and all of these things that you've done. You better play for us. You better get back out there and play for us or we're going to try to tear you down. These people were never for you. They were only looking out for themselves. Because if you don't do what I tell you to do, I'll make your life a living hell. That's how you can know who's on your team. So now they're, they're injecting fear into the equation. It says, then they also bribed officials to act against the frustration and to frustrate their plans throughout the reign of King Cyrus of Persia and until the reign of King Darius of Persia. See, under King Cyrus... They couldn't do anything because the decree to build came from the king. And so they had to kind of be petty. They were doing this, uh, you better stop building, I'm going to get you. You better stop building, I'm going to get you. Or, you know what, I'm, I'm going to take out your lights, or I'm going to, to do this to you. I bust the windows out of your, your, your car. I'm going to make sure you don't get a job. They're fighting these tactics that are right here. They are, they're fighting this hand-to-hand -hand tactics, and it's not working. So they continue to build. And it says they continue to build until leadership changes. They fought hand-to-hand -hand combat until leadership changes. How many of you know that sometimes some seasons require hand-to-hand -hand combat, but other seasons require you to fight a little bit different? And so I want to talk about fighting a little bit different today. If you're taking notes, say, I have to fight. A little bit different so in verse 6 it says at the beginning of the reign of Hazurus the people who were already in the land wrote an accusation against the re residents of Judah and Jerusalem it says during the time of King Artaxerxes of Persia Bishlam Midrath Tabil and the rest of his colleagues wrote to the King Artaxerxes the letter was written in Aramaic and translated. It says, Rahum, the chief deputy of Shimshah, the scribe, wrote a letter to King Artaxerxes concerning Jerusalem as follows. So they realized that me trying to give them fear tactics, it wouldn't work. Then they realized me trying to bribe others to, to, to sabotage the work, that wouldn't work. But then when new leadership came in, they say, aha, we got another plot, we got another plan, we've got another scheme. We won't go to them and try to attack them physically. We're going to go and write a letter to the king. Verse 9, it says, from Rahum, the chief deputy, Shimshah, the scribe, and the rest of their colleagues, the judges and the magistrates from Tripolis and Persia and Iraq and Babylon and Susa, that is the people of Elam, and the rest of the peoples whom the great 
and illustrious Ashurbanipal, deported and settled in the cities of Samaria and the region west of the Euphrates River. This is the text of the letter they sent to him, to King Artaxerxes, from your servants, the men from the region west of the Euphrates. Somebody say there's power in letters. Somebody say there's power in letters. Because sometimes you going back and forth with your baby mama just won't work. Hand-to-hand -hand combat won't work. It's time for you to start using a different form of battle. And so the enemy struck first. They wrote a letter to the king. And this is what it says. It says, let it be known to the king that the Jews who came from you have returned to us at Jerusalem. They are rebuilding that rebellious and evil city finishing its walls and repairing its foundations. They have to list the success of the people that they're trying to, to stop. They've got a good marriage that's going that needs to be torn down. They've got a good job that they're building that needs to be stopped. They've got a good business that they're trying to build that needs to be stopped. They've got a, a good team that they're trying to put together that needs to be destroyed. Let it be known to the king that if they're the city is rebuilt and its walls are finished. They will not pay tribute, duty, or land tax, and the royal revenue will suffer. There it is right there. The money. The money. It's all about the money. For the love of money is the root of evil. So they wanted to have their, their hand in the pot so that they could be recipients of this thing. And so since they can't infiltrate it, they're telling the king that money won't be coming. It says, since we have taken an oath of loyalty to the king and it is not right for us to witness his dishonor, we have sent to inform the king that a search should be done and made in your father's record books. And these record books, you will discover and verify that the city is a rebellious city, harmful to kings and provinces. There have been revolts in it since ancient times. That is why this city was destroyed. We advise the king that if this city is rebuilt and if its walls are finished, you will not have any possessions west of the Euphrates crafted this letter and pretty much told them if you allow them to build this temple if you allow them to build these walls they're going to take your power they're going to take your money they're going to infiltrate your system and there won't be anything for you does that sound sound accurate does that sound like something that we experience now that if you let them get above this looking glass ceiling if they don't stay in their place, if we can't keep them confined to this particular thing, if we can just stop them, if we can just continue to murder them and keep them fearful, if we can just stop them from moving forward, if we can just, just make sure that they don't get on this side of it, if we can shut down the stocks and bonds for them getting in, if we can cut off systems from them going forward, if we can just murder them in the street, if we can keep them fearful, if we can hang them from trees, if we can stop them from rising up, then we can make sure that we don't come the minority in this great nation. And so it is rightful for you to stop these people from building and growing. So we'll, we'll mess with their voter rights because if they begin to vote, we know that things may change. So we need to do some voter suppressions so that their, their dreams and their goals and what's been birthed, they won't rise up. I'm talking in code, yes, but there are, there are us experiencing some tensions that may happen. And even in your areas, there are some political battles that are happening right now. And they're trying to say that you're not welcome without saying you're not welcome. So they'll come up with the 13th Amendment that will abolish one thing, but create a whole new prison system because it's political. Some battles can't be won fist to fist. Some battles are won politically. Healthcare 
big business. We care about the money, so we'll raise up your premiums and we will only give you access to certain things. We'll cut off certain things because we're battling, trying to build something, but human rights we can't overcome. Some of you are going back and forth trying to get your kids and see your kids and folks are standing in the midst of that and you want to kill them. But some battles are not won fist to fist, cuss word to cuss word. Some of you are trying to train up your children in the way they're supposed to go. And I know we've seen things happen, but just because that happens doesn't mean that we verify the behavior that we don't speak to our kids and do things to our children that's going to belittle them and punch them and cuss them out and do things because they're not acting right because God has given us a brown or black belt. He says we got to put away the white belt men mentality. It's our time to be raised up. Let no man have anything, no false word, no ill word that he can say against you because you're growing in these areas. So your marriage, your wife and husband, we're not lining up, we're not seeing eye to eye on us getting married or even sexual intercourse and who's the leader and who's the follower and what the roles are and you want to fight but some battles are not won with fisticuffs. They're handled politically. Economic polarization and isolation of neighborhoods and lines that have been drawn and gerrymandering and you know what I'm talking about, the world that we live in. Some battles are not fight with fisticuffs and hand-to-hand -hand prison systems that are not equally proportioned with 37% of a 17% population group making the most when the numbers just don't add up, but you can't go down there and fight. Fist-to-fist, -fist, some things are not fought. Fist-to-fist, -fist, they're fought politically. Some things happen, education, schools over here, not getting the same thing as schools on this side and taxes being raised on this side to keep folks outside because we want to make sure that we can stay educated and empowered and, and we'll create little things and, and give you little things over here but we'll keep the big piece of the pie. But we can't go fight because some fights are not fought. Fifths the cuffs. Some things are fought politically. Sometimes they try to block access. You can't get in this club. You can't be a part of this group. You can't do this. They'll move the lines of us. They'll, they'll continue to say, nope, now you got to achieve this. Nope, now you got to get a master's. Nope, now you got to get a PhD. Nope, now you got to do this. Now you got to get this certification. And you get mad and frustrated, but some fights are not battled fist to fist. Some things are battled politically. Grocery stores moving out of hoods where people now have to shop at the Dollar General as opposed to having good quality produce and good places with big boxes with fresh fruit and fresh things and you want to go down there and fight and say how can you leave this community but you got to realize that some things are not fought with fist to fist some things are fought politically and they've got people fighting for human rights people fighting just to be human no matter what their goal is, no matter how they're suppressed, they just want the right to be able to live and not die. Some folks have been molested. Some folks have been cheated. Some folks have been stolen from. Some people have robbed you. They've taken the very thing that you've created and they have distorted it. And you want everything in you. They wrote the contract wrong. They charged you high interest rates. And you just woke up and saw that they were giving you 100 and for 20% interest. That you'll never finish paying for those solar panels. And you got mad because you saw that I was taking advantage of. And you just want to go down there and knock everybody out. You want to shoot everybody. But some things are not fault. With fist to fist, some things are fault politically. No matter if they're touching your voting rights, whether they're saying you have to have an ID, or whether they're saying you have to pass a paper bag, paper bag test, whether they're saying that we won't put voting boots in this neighborhood or that place or in that area or in that station, we have to understand 
that in this fight that we're fighting, ladies and gentlemen, this fight is not fought with hand-to-hand -hand combat. Some things are fought politically. I want you to take a page out of the lawyer's handbook. Lawyers, when they go before the judge, they don't sit there and try to plead. He's guilty, sir. The cameras show it. No, what they do is they go back and they get letters. And a good lawyer will go back and study an old case. And they'll look at an old case and they'll look at how a judge handled an old case. And they'll get the old case information and they'll bring it into the courtroom and they'll say, Plessy versus Ferguson, on this particular date, faced the same similar trial. And the way that they fought this particular trial was on this basis they were able to win because Brown versus Board of Education now admits that this particular thing has to happen. See, some of us try not to go back and dig up our history books, but some things in our history can set us free. You got history that will keep you in bondage, but then there's some history that will release you from the bondage that you're in. And we have to understand when to use one over the other. But how many know we have a good lawyer that understands all history, that he can go back into the letters of your generation and you thought you were living out a generational curse, that things in your life that you were going to be a drunkard, but he'll go back and look and see that no, you are a priest, you are a Levite, that you have this chosen generation that's inside of you, that you will overcome this particular thing that you're facing now. But I need you to remind you of who you are, that you are a child of God, that you are blessed and highly favored, that you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus, that no weapon shall be formed against you, that it will be not prosper. You've got to go back and look at some old letters. So what did God do? God says, I know how the political system works. Somebody say, God knows how the political system works. So what did God do? This is what God does. This is what God does. He knows how politics works. So he said, you know what? Since I know how politics work, I'm going to leave a letter to you so that you'll know your power because you're trying to fight in this world the way that the world fights but that's not how you need to fight I'm going to leave letters and so Paul got together and he wrote a letter to Corinthians he let, wrote a letter to Ephesians he wrote a letter through Peter, uh, Peter. he wrote a, a letter and he wrote all of these letters even to the Romans and he wrote these letters but if you go back and look in these letters you'll know that the, the fight is not given to the one that's the strongest or has the hardest punch or the one that can kick or the one that has the biggest gun no it's to the one that understands that my fighting is done in a different way that love will cast out fear that if I understand God's peace I can be in the midst of all types of confusion and I can walk boldly knowing that God is going to order my steps I know that through the letters that God has given me that I can understand that the spirit will lead me so I want to read to you some encouraging letters that will show you how to fight when people have written letters against you. Galatians 5, 16 through 18 says, so I tell you, live the way the Spirit leads you. It says, then you will not do the evil things your sinful self wants to do. The sinful self wants what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit wants what is against the sinful self. They are always fighting against each other so that you know that you don't do what you really want to do, but if you let the Spirit lead you, you are not under the law. What he's saying in that moment, he's saying that there is a spiritual thing element inside of you that's going to be able to withstand the fights that you're going to battle, but you have to tap into the Spirit, which goes back to if you abide in me and I abide in you, it doesn't matter what winters come, it doesn't matter what pruning happens, you will bring forth much fruit. Let me give you another one in Ephesians chapter 6, 13 to 15. It says, therefore put on the full armor of God, not so that you can go and catch a bullet to the heart, but he says, so that when the day of evil comes, somebody, how many know evil's coming? Evil's, evil's writing letters right now while you're here. Evil's writing letters on your kid's future. He's writing letters to, to give you a blockade and to create this, the, the, the confusion and, and diffusion. But guess what? It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of the, the evil one comes, 
you may be able to stand your ground. Somebody say stand ground. Somebody say stand ground. Stand ground. It says, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. Then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, I don't have to lie to get things done. I'll stand firm in my truth. I know who I am. I know who I'm created to be. I'm not going to lie for you. I'm not lying for them. I am going to stand firm. Stand firm. Say stand firm. Say stand firm. Say stand firm. With the belt of truth buckled around you. It says with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And if you read the rest of it, it talks about the helmet of salvation. It talks about the sword of truth. It talks about all of these sword of faith. But here's another letter. Somebody said another letter. In the book of Timothy, it gives us another letter. And it says, 2 Timothy 2.24. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. He says, you got to be in a position where you're not looking for fights to battle with fisticuffs, but you're looking for fights to come with letters that are going to give you victory in what you do. Somebody say, he gave me a letter. But here's the problem with some of your, your lawyership. Some of y'all are still throwing the letters away because you think that if I fight harder, I'll win. I'm going to just tell you this. That's the dumb way to fight. That's not the way to fight. You think that you're going to get tired. You're going to get tired. At some point, it's an easier way to fight. And you got to pick that thing up that's on your nightstand. You know the thing that you look at and be like, I should read it, but now nah, I'm good. Let me turn this trap music on real quick. Or you know that thing when you get into your car and you should be playing one thing. We say, now nah, let me get that. This make me feel good. Or you know Sunday morning when you're like, I need to go learn some more about the letter so I can learn it now. I right, chill. It's time to go to the beach. You'll wind up feeding your flesh, knowing that your flesh is going to be done away with. We're all dying every day. But the Bible tells us to die to the flesh and give life to the spirit. Because if we give life to the spirit, then we can make the declaration that I will live and not die. And so how, this is how you know. This is how you know a person is either fighting in the flesh or fighting in the spirit. Proverbs 29, 22 says, an angry person starts fights. That's how you know a person is not of God. They're always trying to start fight. How many of you know people, they always try looking for a fight. They don't have the spirit. But, but, but this is how he tells us to fight. He says, an angry person starts a fight. A hot-tempered person commits all kinds of sins. It says, but pride ends in humiliation, while humility brings honor. So this week, when they come to check you, when they come to, to, to prod you and to poke you and to punch you and to make you fight, he says, be humble. Be humble. Because this person is going to be humiliated before the masses. And you'll be elevated because those that humble themselves will be exalted. That's a different way to fight. I'm not fighting you like this anymore. I'm fighting you with the letters. Say it's power in the letters. Matthew 5, 39. This is a political word. It says, but I tell you not to oppose an evil person. If someone slaps you on your right cheek, turn your other cheek to him as well. Clarification. It doesn't mean that you're getting slapped like this. No. This is a political thing. Because if he slaps you on your right cheek, he has to use what hand? His left hand. To slap somebody with their left hand means that I am discrediting you, I'm devaluing you. But if you backslap somebody, you are saying that you are equal with me. So if they slap you on your right cheek and your face turns, the only way that they can hit you with the same hand is they have to show that you're equal. 
And so when he says make them turn the other cheek, it's really saying if you want to do this again, you're going to have to say in your actions that me or you are equal. And so when he says turn the other cheek, no, you're not a doormat. No, I'm your equal. And so you can't treat me as a slave. You can't treat me as less than. I'm going to show you that if you try to slap me again, you will be saying that I can stand firm in equality. That's a little Jewish history for you right there, that turning the other cheek doesn't mean that you just keep getting mollywop. No, that's not what God told you to do. Come down here and get mollywop. No, he was sending a message. Then Luke 6, 29 through 31, he said, if someone takes your coat, don't stop him from taking your shirt. Give to everyone who asks for you for something. If someone takes what is yours, don't insist on getting it back. Do for other people everything you want them to do for you. This is another tactic that was political. This is a political tactic. This is what he says. He says, if they come and they take your coat, take off your shirt. So what would happen then if somebody came to rob me and took my coat, I would then take off all of my clothes and run through the streets naked. Because now I'm giving testament and credence that say, well, what's wrong with you? Somebody stole my shirt, but now that humiliates them and puts them on blast. See, if you understand the text, you'll know that these are political battles that are being won, not by human tactics, but it's a level of wisdom that God is giving in order for them to grow. This is how you know this week that you're either fighting a fleshly battle or you're fighting in the spirit. See, the spirit speaks to all of us at the same time. That's why it says that all things will work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So right now, as God is speaking from heaven, he's talking to all of us. Amen? He's giving us the same messages. He's telling us how things should move. He's telling us what's the next step to take. He's giving it to all of us. But this is how you know that the flesh is entering in. If we read the, the rest of Ezra, the last part of this. It says, the king sent a reply to his chief deputy, Rehum, Shimshah, the scribe, and the rest of their colleagues living in Samaria and elsewhere in the region of the west of Euphrates River. Greetings, the letter you have sent us has been translated and read in my presence. I issued a decree and the search was conducted. It was discovered that this city has been had uprisings against kings since ancient times and there have been rebellions and revolts in it. Powerful kings have also been ruled over Jerusalem and exercised authority over the whole region west of the Euphrates River and tribute, duty, and land tax were paid to them. Therefore, issue an order for these men to stop so that this city will not be rebuilt until a further decree has been pronounced by me. See that you do not neglect this matter. Otherwise, the damage will increase and the royal interests will suffer. It says, as soon as the text of King Artaxerxes' letter was read to Rehum, Shimshah, the scribe, and their colleagues, they immediately went to the Jews in Jerusalem and forcibly stopped their work. In this moment, they were building the temple, but the enemy got the best of them, and he stopped the building of the temple. He stopped them. They were stopped. I thought we were talking about undefeated. I thought we were talking about fight through. They killed the work. It says when they killed the work, the Jews dropped their hammers, they dropped their stones, they dropped their wood, and they went home and they started building where there was no opposition. It says for 10 years they stopped the work and they just started building their own homes. What does that look like in today's culture and climate? You was hurt at church or you was hurt in building something. You say, you know what? I'm just going to take care of my family. I'm just going to take care of my children and my wife. I ain't going to worry about building anything. I'm just going to worry about me and mine. I'm just going to do what's good for me and my family. I'm not going to collaborate, which we talked about last week. You have to collaborate, but the enemy is sneaky, and he'll work to make sure that you guys don't bring your resources together to build. And so he won, and so the people went home, and they began to work in their own homes, not collectively bringing things together, not sharing ideas, not making a mecca. See, the temple was a place that they all came 
came together on one accord for one purpose, and that was to build up. That was to, to grow things. That was to get healing. That was to restore. That was to sacrifice. The place that they would come together to get their healing, to come and get resolved from sins, to come and get absolved from sins, to come and be able to come together and collaborate. The thing that made them the greatest, the enemy won. And he said, no longer do you need to go to that place. You don't need to go to that church. You don't need to go to that temple. You don't need to go collaborate. You don't need to get connected. You just need to be isolated. And when the enemy isolates you, you know that you are working in the flesh and not in the spirit. 